Hi, I'm here today with Keith Spitternick from Target Property Spain. Um, he's agreed to come on our first ever podcast. Uh, this is the Fluent Finance Abroad po podcast, the Spanish mortgage experts here. Uh, and the podcast is, is we're going to discuss different topics that I think are relevant in today's market in the, in the Spanish real estate market. Welcome, Keith. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. The great topic to start with would be the regulation or non-regulation of Spanish real estate. It's a topic that I haven't seen talked about a lot. I, I find it very interesting. The viewers may or may not, depending on their viewpoint. But there's some big differences between the way the mortgage industry is regulated and the real estate agent sector in Spain is regulated. So, well, from my perspective, just so that everyone knows, mortgage regulation in Spain didn't really exist until 2019, so it's a fairly new concept. But and how long has Fluent Finance been been in operation? Well, Fluent Finance Board was created in 2006. So you've gone through that shift then of working in an unregulated industry to now being fully regulated. Yeah, it was even it was more a start really for me because I, I'm a UK, well, I used to work in the UK as a mortgage broker, so I came... Uh, in 2004 from a highly regulated environment to a non-regulated environment. The Wild West. The Wild West. Yeah, style. it was like a country in Western, yeah. uh, uh, the good, the bad and the very ugly. <laughs> Present company accepted. <laughs> uh, and then, to, you know, calling for regulation because we, you know, we needed it. And to finally actually have the regulation in place in 2019. Now, as I understand it, in the Costa del Sol, real estate agents are not regulated, is that right? Yeah, correct. I mean, the, the, the brief history is that prior to 2000, the real estate um, industry in Spain was regulated. And then the government took a decision to split that up because Spain's made up of 17 autonomous communities. So they gave that power to each autonomous community to decide whether to regulate or not. The advice was to regulate, but it actually took 10 years for the first autonomous community, which was Catalonia, to bring regulation in. So now in Catalonia, they have to do a 200 hours training course and they have to have professional liability insurance as well. It then took another 10 years or so until the next community brought it in, which was Valencia, yeah. which adopted similar measures, but they also imposed that a real estate agent has to have a physical office to work from. Um, and then it wasn't until 2024 that it was uh, imposed in the Balearics as well. Now, I get the reasoning for it because, you know, selling a property in Madrid is very different to selling a property on the Costa del Sol. There's different cultural nuances, there are different ways of, of, of doing business. The upshot is that we've only got three autonomous communities regulated and the Costa del Sol is not one of them. So we have unlicensed real estate brokers here. And no. you're, can I just say, you're one of them, right? We're, well, we're unlicensed because the industry is unlicensed, yeah. but we subscribe to an association. Okay. So previous to 2000, you had uh, AIP and you had HIPE in its previous format. And then um, obviously the power was given to the autonomous communities. Uh, but we subscribe to the, the new rebirth of HIPE, um, which is an association of real estate agents. You have to undergo training to be a member of the association and you also have professional liability insurance. So your client's funds are protected and your, your service is, is protected by liability insurance. What kind of training do you have to go through? <clears throat> Various from uh, contract law, um, anti-money laundering, legislation, consumer protection. I mean, it's, 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 it's a fairly lengthy course that covers urban planning, for example covers various aspects of the of the real estate industry, which is good, you know, because at the end of the day, we're advising clients on six, seven, eight figure transactions. So, I mean, we're, we're an advocate of regulation. Are the exams that difficult to pass? Honestly, no. It's a training course, but I still think you need to have something behind you because you're advising clients on such large transactions i think agents need to take some sort of responsibility for that you've got to have some sort of level of knowledge about the industry that you're in right yeah and i think that's the danger in the costa del sol is that you know there's no real barrier to entry we have new agents jumping into the industry advising clients on transactions without really the product knowledge or the market knowledge that they deserve 
It goes deeper than just product knowledge though as well, isn't it? It's like, for example, it's like how it actually works. How does a, a real estate transaction actually is structured? You know, things about how the property is registered on the land registry. What is a not a simply? Yeah. What is that compared to the catastrophe? Now we do mortgages and we, so many times we have to deal with real estate agents that haven't the foggiest about how a deal is supposed to be structured. And that obviously makes our makes the, the deal more complex because I'll give you a prime example. At the moment, we're trying to deal, to explain to a client that there's an issue with their property in terms of how it's registered on the land registry. The client then goes away and speaks to the real estate agent and the real estate agent doesn't know what they're talking about and saying that we're are the ones that are incorrect and we don't know what we're talking Yet about. Yet you're regulated and the agent isn't. Exactly yeah. right. Now yeah. we've gone through all this training and we understand because we, technically we have to understand it. We have to understand the legalities of, because otherwise a mortgage will not be granted if it's not legally correct. Um, but the, this is the, the frustration that we get. You know, we expect that fellow professionals or, should have a, a decent level of understanding as to what is involved in a property transaction. I think the problem is, as I see it, is that we've had, a, since COVID, we've had a few very, very good years in the real estate industry. And when business is good, anyone can sell, sell real estate. You know, you're, you're, you're not even really a, a real estate consultant, you're an order taker in many situations. And I think the danger is that a lot of new agents jump onto that bandwagon um, and in, because of the way the real estate market works here, and a lot of agents will share transactions. So quite often one agent will have the listing and another agent will bring the buyer and they, and they share the fee. Um, the danger is that, yeah, you jump into a deal with an inexper inexperienced agent and you have no idea what they're telling their clients. And they're dangerous agents to do deals with because you get four, six weeks down the line and the, and the whole deal collapses. Yeah, because there was a misinformation or the right information wasn't disclosed at the, at the outset, which is unacceptable because, in my opinion, you know, as you quite rightly say, you're dealing with big amounts of money. Um, and therefore, there's some sort of level of responsibility should be there for people that want to enter and play, play the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm interested to know how much regulation uh how what the process that you guys had to go through to to jump from being unregulated to to regulated was that quite onerous um in in reality no um it wasn't it was quite light touch uh, so yes we had to you know pass an exam <clears throat> which uh which isn't isn't straightforward because it's in spanish my mother tongue is actually english obviously uh, I do speak very good, you know, a, a high level of Spanish, but, but it was pretty difficult because it was a lot of technical stuff, a lot of legal stuff. Um, so the exam, getting that out of the way was massive, but then actually getting registered with the Bank of Spain was fairly easy. Now, the issue that we're having is how to stay regulated and how do you, how do you stay licensed? Because you, the reporting that you have to do to the Bank of Spain is quite onerous. Um, and it's continual um, and, and obviously your knowledge so you have to do an exam every year so you are all constantly refreshing your knowledge um, with the new changes in legislation and anything else like that. they're constantly testing you so maintaining regulation maintaining your license is actually a bit more of a challenge than it was actually obtaining it in the first place but I guess in the same breath it also separates the good guys from the bad guys yeah because yeah, if it is quite challenging then the, I, I hesitate to use the word cowboys, but the, shall we say, less than perfect advisors will, will fall by the wayside. It all depends how committed you are as a business or, or, or as, a, as a professional. Um, I've been in the mortgage business in the UK and Spain for coming on 25 years now, so I'm pretty committed to it. I'm, <laughs> that's a long, that's yeah. a long gig. Um, so it doesn't matter what they throw at us, we're gonna do it because this is our career. Um, what it will stop and what it is stopping is those that think, oh, I fancy being a mortgage advisor. Yeah. Like what's happening in the real estate industry at the moment. In, yeah. Which is exactly, there's no barrier of entry. Yeah. And so there's no commitment. You don't need to commit anything or demonstrate any knowledge for you to enter. Yeah. You may dip your toe in and decide it's not for you and then dip your toe out. But what damage have you done? Yeah, I mean, we always say to our clients, look, if you don't decide to use us, 
make sure you use an agency that subscribes to an association and has done some exams. You know, they don't necessarily have to have an office. Personally, I think it's better if an agency does have an office and a physical presence. But they don't necessarily have to have an office, but make sure they've got that liability insurance so that if you are sending your funds to their client accounts, you know that you've got protection. So you, do, you, do, do you handle clients' money? Um, if a client wants to pay a deposit, we generally recommend that they send it to their lawyer's account. Um, but of course, we have a client account as well, which they're welcome to send so their funds to. Let's say, for example, we do a deal on a weekend, on a Saturday, Saturday morning, we, agree, we agree, agree a deal, and the lawyer's not open till Monday, and it's a hot property, the client doesn't want to miss out, then yeah, we, we've given our client account details. So in this market, in this unregulated market, you there is no barrier to stop any agency, good, bad or not, to accept client money. Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah, shocking. Yeah, yeah. That's outrageous. I mean, they should be doing an anti-money laundering um, process and a KYC and know your clients. 99% um, of them don't. Um, most of Sophia's work in the office, most of her work is, she's tasked with that. So going through the, the KYC and the AML processes. But I would say we're probably in the minority. Um, most of the agencies that subscribe to either HePay or, or API, yes, they would do that. But the lion's share of agents here, they don't subscribe to an association. So what clients can actually send money to totally unregulated, un unsupervised people? They often do, yeah. yeah. That is outrageous to yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, I always think, would I do that? And <laughs> No, but I guess, you know, the. It, the client comes over here, they're not familiar with the territory, they have a point of contact who's guiding them rightly or wrongly, um, and they probably feel secure. But again, the advice I always give is please make sure that they are they subscribe to an association and have that public liability insurance. Surely the Junta Andalucía must be concerned about this, or, or is it just not been a problem? Um, I'm not sure, maybe they've got bigger fish to fry. <laughs> They, they do have a few challenges to to, to, to And how, how would it be regulated then? Like, would you take the same model as in Valencia and, and, and Catalonia? Yeah, I mean, if it was down to me, I'd say yes, definitely the training, the insurance as we've talked about, and the physical office. I think the future may be shifting back towards one blanket regulation for the whole country. But that's quite a delicate balance, you know, to maintain the... the um, the, the balance between having each autonomous community governing its own region and blanket legislation covering the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, but I sense that may be the way we're going. Um, I know Andalusia, there are talks about regulation coming in, which we absolutely welcome. How far away it is, who knows? It took 10 years from 2000 to mm -hmm. 2010 for Catalonia to impose it. Okay, so you mentioned um, a couple of associations, and you're a member of the GIPA. Yeah, we're a member of HIPE. HIPE. Yep. Um, but there are some others that I keep hearing about. Um, yeah, well, in the Costa del Sol, you've got um, HIPE, API have a presence here as well, both of which require you to take some kind of an exam. Um, you've got others, you've got an agency, uh, a association called LPA, um, but I think pretty much with that, you pay your subscription fee and you're welcomed. Um, I don't think there's any training there. Right. There's, there's countless others throughout Spain, but I think the two that really carry weight down here are, are HIPE and, AP, and API. Okay, so, so there's lots of different associations. Some are more valuable than others? Yeah, I'd say some are more of just a, an old boys club right. rather than an association of 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 credible professionals so there isn't one that you know you could sort of say look we're this is the master regulator or the master uh, association to to be no not with. until we are regulated down so, here in Andalusia. So there's nothing to stop me in creating an association of real estate agents absolutely nothing at all nothing no, no. Uh, you know, i can stick that badge on my business card and my website yeah but the key difference is will you be providing your members with liability insurance and training. So by being a member of, of HIPE, for example, or API, I guess, I guess as well, um, there's also like a level of, of enforcement. There's a code of conduct. Um, and if that code of conduct is breached, then you can be excluded from the association. Okay, Keith, um, that's great. Uh, thank you for covering that topic about regulation and, and, and the lack of in Andalusia. See you on the next one.
Great, let's tie it up and go and grab a coffee.